Questions. There are seven questions, and I, as I said, I am very late, but let us try to do this. So, the questions most people ask, what is wrong with pornography? So, once again, I hope I can teach you to think in these three ways. Okay? People think that, we are, I hear this word very often, I am a free thinker. You can only f be free if you have options. And as far as I can see, people have only one option, this dualistic utilitarian mentality. So I hope today we can go back home with three options, and then you will be free to choose which option do you like better. So that's my only goal here. So if you have a dualistic utilitarian view, there is nothing wrong with pornography. It is actually quite fun. <laughs> it is a private issue. It doesn't involve anyone. It is only watching stuff. So there's no harm, nobody gets hurt, people enjoy it, it is a good market, and all advantages, no harms, verdict, okay. What about if you have another perspective, that the philosophy of the body per perspective? Then you think that it is, what is pornography? Pornography is to will, it's not watching, nudity. Okay, you can watch nudity and you don't intend to, or you don't want to, or perhaps you have to make a, a, a project or whatever. Okay, it is the will to use pornography to become, uh, to enjoy some kind of gratification with that. So it is to will and enjoy that genital activity be used as a form of entertainment for others' consumption for, or for yourself. So it's, this is the question. Is consuming porn a way to attain more meaningful and fulfilling sexual relationships <laughs> with a spouse, or does it contribute to expect that genital activity is fulfilling when it fits our fantasies? What, which one do you think it is? So once again, my point here is to, we have to start to ask the right question. The right question is not how many people get hurt, or what kind of hurt it, it does. So what are you doing to your own sexuality when you are doing this? It fosters the illusion of satisfying the need for intimacy, but it actually does not. That is why it becomes, it is so easily addictive. It alienates people into a world of fantasy, preventing them from realistic sexual development. So consuming pornography is watching pornography consume you. And this is why it is addictive. From the point of view of TOB, the beauty of the human body resides not only in its being physically attractive, but more deeply in the fact that it reflects the plan of God to share his divine happiness with us eternally. So the question is, does pornography reflect that? Or does pornography have other ends? Does pornography have the end of arouse, last, lustful desires in the other person? I think the answer is pretty obvious. That is what they want. Okay. The actors and the uh, people who made those images want to elicit lustful desires. So, in the same vein, what is wrong with this? If you have a dualistic utilitarian mentality, nobody gets hurt, it is normal, most males do it. Many women do it, uh, especially common in adolescence. Uh, so if some people does not do it, something seems to be wrong with them. Uh, it is generally a private practice that with no harmful side effects. As long as its practice is kept healthy, there is nothing wrong with it. So it has obvious benefits, okay? You can, there are websites saying 10 benefits of uh, in this practice. Okay. Uh, once again, this is the wrong question. The right question is, what does it do to yourself? What kind of person do you become by using this? Okay. So it willfully dissociates genital gratification from a true relationship. There is no relationship here. Uh, it effectively teaches the body, and I want to insist this, okay? Every practice we do, remember, skills usually involve our bodies. This is why the first session was so important. And I, once again, I regret the fact that we, I don't have time, but I, I really think this is important. If you learn cooking, it is not only your mind that is cooking, your body is learning cooking. And this learning is deeper than the, the learning of the, of the mind. And this is why it is so difficult 
to contradict these teachings, what the body is learning. If you play football, it is not only your mind that is learning to play football, it is your body that is learning to play football. Okay. If you smoke and you read the side effects of the smoke in your uh, cigarette package, your mind understands how bad it is, but your body doesn't understand anything. Actually, your body understands how good it is. And this is why it's so difficult to quit. Because the message of the body is, this is really great. And the message of the mind is not so intense. This is really bad, according to the paper here. Unless you get cancer or something like that, in which your body learns how bad it is. And then it is much, much easier to quit smoking. Because your body is telling you, I know how bad it is as well. So this is why practice or the skills are so important and so crucial. Because it is not only an action of the mind, it is an action of the body. It is knowledge of the body. And our bodies know for us. So all these practices involve the body. It means we are constantly teaching our bodies these things. And even if our minds think differently, we are not going to convince the body so easily. So it effectively teaches the body that genital gratification is a sufficient use of one's sexual organs, and this will apply later in marriage. It fosters the need to exercise genital acts and prevents people from being truly free. And it treats one's sexual organs as tools of genital gratification, what is, and we remember from the philosophy of the body, what is intimate is necessarily personal. What is personal should not be used for other purposes, even if it is good. Remember, you can use marriage to have some nationality. That is a good purpose. There is nothing wrong with attaining a, a nationality. But it's not about the ends. It is also about the means. It is very good that if you push a fat guy, five people are saved. But the question is not what happens after you push the fat guy. The question is, what are you doing by pushing the fat guy? The end does not justify the means. I hope now you start to put things together. Theolo from the theology of the body, is masturbation an act of lust or an act of purity of heart? I think that is an easy question. Does it help the person to be free from lustful desires or deepens lustful desires in people? Does it prepare people to make their marital acts more meaningful? Or just like in the case of pornography, do you expect your spouse to perform as well as the actors in the, in the screen? Which we know every, they are actors. Their, their work is to lie, <laughs> to, to, to reflect something that is not, not real. Does it help people to make their marital acts acts of prophetic proclamation of the word of God? I think those questions are quite obvious, but these are the right questions. Casual sex, OK. So from the dualistic uh, utilitarian view, it is only sex, only physical, nothing personal. Because both persons consent and know about this. It is an action of two responsible adults and should be free to do what they want as long as they don't hurt anyone. It is consensual. Even if you label it a lie, uh, this is important. Okay? So the issue of the philosophy of the body is not only that it is a lie, that it is a degrading action. Because if it is a lie, as long as two people know that we are mut mutually lying to each other, it is not a lie anymore. Okay? That's why when we watch movies, we know that that is not real. But the actors know that we know, and we know that they know. So it is not, they don't go, the actors don't need to go for confession after that. Okay? Because both parties know the, real, the reality. But in this case, even if the two parties know that the body is saying something, what is wrong here is that we are degrading something intimate and personal, and we are treating it as a tool to attain other ends. When you push off a guy, you are using him as a tool to save five people. You are using a person. If there were a sack of potatoes and I push it, and the sack of potatoes save the five guys, there is nothing wrong with that. Okay? So I hope that is clear. From the philosophy of the body point of view, it assumes that we can use the switch there. I explained that the first day. It wrongly assumes that we can switch on and off the meaningfulness of the sexual act. Only sex. We can do that with diamonds. Depends on how valuable it is for me. OK? OK. Diamonds have value in itself. So the same thing for uh, uh, sexual act. It has value in itself. 
Okay. Here is the important aspect. We can, what we can do, what people think we are doing is that it doesn't have any value in my mind. I decide whether this is personal and how important it is. What we are actually doing is two things. The body is sending this is a true union, and our mind is saying not a true union. There is a contradiction here. And therefore, I'm using this language to get some benefits. Okay. So our bodies speak of unity, and both parties know that there is no such unity. So it teaches the body, once again, the importance of the body, that sexual encounters are superficial and important, and, and impersonal, sorry. It degrades sexual acts and sexuality in the persons from something intimate and personal to something instrumental and impersonal. From the theology of the body, people who engage in casual sex dissociate sexual activity from its role in God's plan. Casual sex is the counterfeit of real sex. The persons are simply exercising the role of false prophets. So what does it mean? False prophets told people what they like to hear. You want to be a popular prophet? Tell people, go into the market. Tell people what they like to hear, and do, you will be very, uh, very popular. You tell people what God says, you're not going to be very popular but you are going to be a true prophet. Same thing here, okay? People engaging in casual sex, they tell each other what they like to hear. They don't tell each other the truth of God's plan for sexuality. Okay, so that's the easy bit, okay? We said that uh, sex is always intimate and personal, so everybody, every time you do it outside the very personal uh, relationship should be wrong. You are using it for other purposes, but what about people who really love each other, people who um, have the genuine intention of uniting their lives. So dualistic utilitarian view, sex is the natural expression of sexual affection. It is only natural that two people in love express it naturally. So as long as they are responsible adults that take precautions, it is okay. So teach teens about contraceptives. The marriage does not change the quality of their love, it simply it simply is the official approval of it. So if you think you have a dualistic utilitarian view, this is what you would think. If you have the other view, um, if you want to put these two things together, okay, what would be the last point that is united? This is an easy question. Even people from the front row can, can answer. You take two shapes, what's any, any shapes, and you put them together. What is the first thing that, that, that touches? Their surfaces, right? And the last, their centers, right? So the same thing for sex. If we have said that the sexuality is the intimate aspect of the body that stands for the intimacy of the person, naturally, should be the last thing to be united geometrically speaking, if we want. Practically speaking, okay, practical issue. Uh, boyfriend and girlfriend come to me and say, I think we are ready for sex. Okay, good. Question, would you put all your money in his bank account? Hmm, I never thought of that. Do you think he would put all his money in your bank account? Hmm, never thought of that. So if you are not ready to put your money in one bank account, do you think ready to, are you ready to unite your bodies? Once again, it depends. If you are dualistic and you think that your body is nothing personal and your money is very, very, very personal, then you may tend to say yes. <laughs> but if you are thinking with the philosophy of the body behind your mind, you may think that your body is the most, the intimacy of your body is the most personal thing you have in your body. And you shouldn't, that should be the last thing you unite. So please consider it only after you have united your bank accounts. And the question now is, is joining the bank accounts good enough? So it depends on where you put. As I said before, the last thing to be united, united should be the intimacy of the bodies. We said that the sexual act is not simply an expression of affection, but an expression of marriage. Why? Because it communicates what marriage is. You don't have to do anything to it. It speaks by itself, it speaks of fidelity, it speaks of totality and exclusivity, because I give you the most intimate aspect of myself, and it's, it's, uh, it communicates uh, life. 
So sex before marriage will still be a lie. It's like your bodies are saying, we are totally united, most intimately united and exclusively united, but you are not. You haven't said that. Your wills have not done that. Your wills do that when they come to the public and say, I commit myself to give myself to this person unconditionally all the days of my life. And that is what sex does. It speaks of that promise. So any time that is done before the promise, of course it will be more excusable than the ones because there is this desire to be united. And that, that, unite, that union or that desire is really genuine and authentic and, and, and good. But it's only when it is done after the union of the wills that it really speaks the truth that has happened. So only when people vow to unite totally their lives, they become ready to unite intimacy of their bodies. And that union becomes an expression of what has happened. And we, that is why the church calls this consummation of marriage. The marriage is consummated in the sexual act because precisely speaks of what has happened in the altar that day or before. Okay. And from the theology of the body, these sexual acts, the sexual act is a prophetic marital act that expresses the truth of God's plan, the total and unreserved self-giving of Christ to us. So only when people who are married capacitate each other with the power of, to be true prophets, kings and priests, to each other through their marital acts. So that is what we have to be. Being a Christian means being Christ-like. Being Christ-like means exactly this, being a king like Christ, a prophet like Christ, and a priest like Christ for everyone, even lay people. So marital acts are truly acts of marriage, sacramental acts of marriage, in the sense that they become acts of love, kingly service, acts of divine fidelity, uh, prophetic service, that communicates the plan of God for the other person in acts of worship through sacrifice for the other person, as we said before in the theology of the body. Okay, I have been talking for one hour. I am not going to cover all the topics. This is the last topic, and I think today we are not going to have the break. I really want to give you a chance to ask questions, and this is the last topic I'm going to cover. Contraception. Once again, I hope this is becoming more clear. There are three ways of looking at this. Okay? Dualistic mentality, uh, utilitarian mentality. What are the consequences of uh, contraception? The consequences of contraception is you don't have unwanted pregnancies. What happens if you use natural family planning? Exactly the same consequences. You don't have unwanted children. So it is the same. And Everybody says the same thing. What's the difference between using NFP or knowing that uh, we are going to be fertile if we have sex today, so let us stop having sex or let us not, do have, uh, not have sex, or we use a condom. It is the same thing. Okay. Once again, yeah, if you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. It has the same intention and consequences, consequences as avoiding sex to avoid a pregnancy, thus is, uh, thus is that's one is right, uh, so if one is right, so is the other. Both are right. It is irresponsible to have too many children, and when the children must never be born, and fertility is a capacity of the body, nothing personal. Okay. Let me be, be very quick. Okay, imagine my brother is coming, to, is coming to Malaysia, and he wants to visit me. And I write him an email, please don't come. I don't have available beds. I have to give many talks. I cannot accompany you. Other year, you come to Malaysia and you come and visit me and I attend to you. Okay? My brother being my brother and being younger, that never listens to me. So he says, I'm so close, never mind, I go. So I open my house and I see my brother there and I say, okay, I'm happy to see you. Okay? My brother goes away and then comes my cousin. My cousin comes to Malaysia and he says the same thing. I wrote him an email saying the same thing. Please don't come now. Just in case he comes, I pull down the blinds, I lock the door, I block the windows, I make sure there is no hole big enough in my house for my cousin to squeeze through. Right? And my cousin comes, 
being uh, from my family, has the same thing, the same <laughs> tendency as my brother. And he finds a window open, enters to the window. I come down the stairs and I see him in the hall and say, oh, you're here. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> now, notice that you didn't laugh. I said the same thing, OK? Here is the thing. I said the same thing to my brother, and you didn't laugh. And I said to my cousin, I'm so happy to see you, and you laughed. Why did you laugh? What is the difference between the two? Is there a real difference? The only difference here is that I block his access to the house. But what does it mean that I block his access to the house? Is that compatible with saying, I'm so happy you are here? Yeah. Obviously, I'm lying. If my cousin had seen me closing his access to the house, he said, yeah, right. I just saw you blocking the, uh, the, the windows, uh, <laughs> locking the, the door, and pulling down the blinds, pretending nobody's home. What is contraception? Contraception is blocking the access, not to a pesky cousin, which that is OK if you want to, but to your own child. And there's a difference between telling my brother, I, don't, I prefer if you don't come. Precisely because I love him, I don't want him to sleep on the floor because I don't have beds. I don't, have, I, w I don't want him to get lost in Singapore because I cannot accompany him. And that is totally different. So that message, that email, is a consequence of my love. I'm not ready for you. Please don't come. In the case of my cousin, I did something totally different. I said, I don't want you here. My brother's visit was a surprise, but not unwanted. So when he comes up, I say, OK, you are here. I'm really genuinely happy to see you. And let us see how we do this. Perhaps you have to sleep on the floor, or I have to sleep on the floor. I give you a map, and you go around Singapore by yourself, because I don't have time to attend to you. But that is not what I did to my cousin. The fact that I block his access to the house is totally incompatible with my happiness for him to be there. So that's what contraception does to one's own child. So that it is a different kind of option, it is obvious. That attains the same result, it is also obvious. Just like pushing a fat guy attains the same result as turning the train. But it is a totally different kind of action. Pushing a fat guy is murder. Turning the train may be something you do in order to save five lives that has unfortunate side effects. If you don't like this, I give you another one. The moment you give, you offer something, people had two choices, either accept it or reject it. Is that clear? So if I offer you, no diamond, sorry. Can you take this? She takes it, accepts, OK? Uh, she has only two options. She didn't have to exercise any option because I didn't offer it to her. She could be totally neutral. She could accept it, and I wish she give it to me, or she could reject it. But we don't know what is her action, her decision. She hasn't made any decision. She has to make a decision. Now, isn't it true that when couples engage in potentially fertile sex, they are offering each other a pregnancy? Yes. And a pregnancy is not something, it's someone, not anyone, not a pesky cousin, your own child. So if they are offering each other their own child, now they have to make a decision either accept it or reject it. So it doesn't matter how you name it. Contraception is an act of rejection of your own possible child. The question is, is that compatible with the gospel that calls us to love unconditionally everyone, mainly spouses and children? So if you want to, to put it more clear, and with this I finish. This is what contraception does. I'm not going to pursue having a child now. I want to pursue this act of probably fertile sex, which I know is probably pursuing having my own child. So I will make this probably fertile act infertile. It doesn't matter what you do. You can do it with contraceptives or with uh, withdrawal, anything. It does not depend on how artificial or how natural it is. It is an ethical action. It depends on your will. It does not depend on the method. Abstaining from fertile sex. I'm not going to pursue having a child now. Parents should never reject a possible child. That is what you think. So I'm not going to pursue rejecting my possible child, which means I shall abstain from sex when it is fertile, and I shall abstain from contraception if I'm not uh, 
y fallan factor. And those are totally different kinds of actions. And you don't need a, a degree in philosophy to see the huge difference, just like you don't need a degree in philosophy to see the difference between my cousin's visit and my brother's visit. We have uh, about uh, 40 minutes of uh, questions. I tried to answer already some of the questions you may have. As I said before, I did plan for the other topics that everybody asks, which is divorce and same-sex issues. But uh, per perhaps I should hear your questions first so that I can not only answer to the questions I have in my head, but the questions you have in your head. Anyone wants to? Anyone wants to start the ball rolling, or any clarifications about what any anything I said before? Yes. Um, how does annulment in marriage? Okay. Okay. Uh, annulment is not my my forte, but this is very simple. It's a, it's a, annulment simply means that there was never married marriage in the first place. So annulment is not divorce. Divorce is the dissolution of marriage. Uh, one of the things I would say here is that the, uh, there is no divorce of uh, sacramental marriages. I said this before, OK? Sacramental marriages are meant to express the union of Christ with the church. And that is why they have no dissolution. Because Christ never abandons the church. The church is not, never supposed to abandon Christ. So, Sacramental marriages are supposed to express that, okay? So even if some marriages can have recourse to civil divorce, but in the eyes of the church, they are still married, okay? I want to be very clear about this because there are many, a lot of confusions of this, okay? So one couple can be married, sacramental marriage, and they decide they are killing each other every weekend, okay? And they cannot live like that. So the church allows for as formalized separation. There are actually, you can, it is a state that you can formalize. And you can live in separate houses, one in the North Pole and the other one in the South Pole. You make sure you never fight again. Okay? If, for practical purposes, a divorce is suitable and helps the spouses to divide property, to resolve issues about children, the church allows these people to have recourse to civil divorce. But it doesn't mean that they are divorced. Okay, I want to be very clear about that, about this. In the eyes of the church, they are still married because that marriage cannot be dissolved. They just have a legal uh, arrangement that allows them for some practical solutions in their lives, which means that these people cannot get married again because they are not truly divorced. Okay, they are still married and they cannot remarry again. And if they do, as things are now in the church, it is considered a second marriage and therefore invalid, and therefore uh, against the laws of the church that allows only to marry one person uh, until the end of their lives. So that's one thing. Annulment means that uh, when you got married, you did something that uh, you didn't know what you, you were doing or you didn't really want to do. Okay, those are the main, uh, two of the main uh, components of, uh, of, uh, of an annulment. It means that, uh, that there was never married in the first, marriage in the first place. And you give, you, you, so it needs a, a kind of trial when one party defends the bond, another party defends your position. And if you win the, the, the case, then your marriage is considered annulled, which means declared that there was never marriage in the first place. Even if they have children and they have been married for 20 years. Okay, is that very clear? Okay. So in, if you prove that, then it means you can marry again, because there was no first marriage in the first place. OK, that was easy. Another one. No questions. <laughs> this must be the first audience. OK, but there is a clause that says, um, under Matthew, it says, except for unchastity. Wow, they that's. Allow for divorce. OK. That, okay, there are two, this is very good. There's a, okay, I will repeat the, the question. He, he quotes the, the clause from Matthew. Yeah. In the Gospel of Matthew, he says there is a, except in the case of, the Greek, the Greek word says porneia, 
and here comes the issue. How do you translate that? So some Bibles, uh, some, uh, Bibles translate as immorality. Or any of the, uh, it has been, so first of all, uh, there are issues in the translation where you translate except in case, or there is another translation that is even in the case of, uh, of, uh, of um, immorality. And the second issue is how do you translate the word itself? And it has been shown already that what they understood by immorality it was precisely in the case of illegal marriage. So if your marriage was not valid in the same place, in the first place, it would be considered a case, a case of annulment. But that translation problems aside, uh, the other version of uh, Mark, I think, doesn't give any, any exceptions. And the question is not only what the Bible says, but uh, how the church has received these teachings. Okay? We interpret the, the, the Bible wrote, the, the church wrote the Bible and the Bible teaches the church. So there is a mutual, a mutual interaction between, between the two. And since the beginning, the church has understood that the, once you are married, you are married, and if you are not married, then you can marry again. But the, the, there is no dissolution of marriage. The church has quite been consistent with that. But that is a very good technical question. There's another technical question here. Uh, please comment on the gender theory. Is there a basis for this theory? Okay, this is one of the reasons why I don't like this. Uh, I, I will go back, back to you now. Uh, sorry, uh, because I, what gender theory are you talking about? Anyone knows what this gender theory is? See, that's, that's why I prefer when people speak. Okay, I repeat, please comment on the gender theory. Is there any basis for this theory? Anyone knows what this gender theory may refer to? That's not a theory, that is a fact. That <laughs> <laughs> men are men and uh, women are women. I, I really don't, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, I'm not trying to be funny, just that I, I don't specifically know what this uh, theory refers to. So if you can tell me, you don't want to tell me now, you can tell me at the end of the, of the session. I'm very willing to answer, but uh, honestly, there are many theories out there, and today there are many theories. So I, I don't know if you are referring to the fact that they, in the past, in the, it was in the 60s and 70s, some psychologists thought that uh, gender was a cultural thing. It was not a natural thing. That you could teach people, and there was a, uh, terrible cases of uh, mistakes uh, using this. Okay, this is a very infamous case of, a, of a, someone called David, by the way, uh, that uh, his uh, he was a twin brother, and there were some problems uh, during his circumcision, and the doctors cut too much, and they didn't know they couldn't fix it. Okay, and so one psychologist thought that it would be a good idea to test this theory. I don't know if you are referring to this. That uh, never mind, you just cut off the whole thing, and you tell him it is a girl. Okay, and that's what they did. Okay, and he. Eventually, when he became an adolescent, uh, he couldn't uh, tolerate this. He couldn't even tolerate the sessions with the psychologist who was uh, monitoring this. And basically, that the theory that uh, sexual identity is something cultural is, is simply not a good theory. Okay? The sexual identity is natural. All our cells in the body have, are either male or female. Uh, if, uh, all male in males and all female in female and gender identity is something that is totally natural, chromosomal, hormonal, biological, psychological, and spiritual. So I don't know if you refer to this, but that's the only thing I can do. I'm childless, what can I, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, can, can I hear from, from you first? Yeah, is there a yes. Uh, is there a yes. Mm -hmm. So you're saying something that uh, you lock the house for your cousin yep. because your house is full. But that technically is not wrong. And I, and yeah, yeah, okay, yes, yes, yes. So I'm going to clarify another thing. The argument is based on the assumption that there is a possibility of there being a child. However, yes. if there is no possibility of there being a child, then contraception is right. 
it wouldn't be contraception. Okay, let me just go for, for the first one. You are right. As I said before, you can block your access to the house to pesky cousins. There is no commandment that says you thou shall accept unconditionally any pesky cousin. But as I said, there is, I just used the example to see the difference in the way you act. I acted with my brother and I acted with my cousin. The difference is, was obvious. Now, so the question is, can you treat, it, it is licit to treat your cousin like that. But the question is, is it licit to treat your own child like that? So that's, that's a huge difference, okay? We don't have any duty to love unconditionally our, uh, I mean, if we are Christians, we do, but uh, it's a, you still can love them and say, sorry, I don't have time for you, and uh, okay, you have the, you're entitled to block the house to, the, to your cousin, right? That's why everybody has keys to the house. But the question is, what about your own children? Okay, and the, the second aspect is, what, uh, what I said is contraception is, to make infertile what is fertile. So it is not fertile in the same place, in the first place, you cannot contracept. So people who are menopause, for example, couples who are menopause already, they cannot contracept unless they think they are fertile and they are doing it with intention of blocking their fertility. Is that clear? Uh, actually, I was asking about whether contraception was wrong, but the basis for the argument that contraception was wrong was on the possibility that there's a child. So should uh, like okay. doctors develop something that makes contraception 100% without the possibility of children? Then no, that, that's precisely, it doesn't matter. Even, even precisely because it is effective, the more effective it is, the more immoral it is, because you are making something infertile. And the, why are you making it infertile to reject your own possible child. So if your question is, a good objection, uh, objection is that there is no child. In the case of the cousin, there is a child, there is a cousin. So there is no real child. There is only the possibility of a child. That's, that's a real, a real uh, objection to the, I mean, question, not objection. And once again, we have, to, we have to, to go back to the issue of pulling the trigger. Because I could be dead, and you can still intentionally kill me. Does that make sense? So we, that's why I insisted so much that we have to shift our understanding of morality. We not only need a sexual revolution, we, I think we need an ethical revolution. And because the two are not revolving, <laughs> uh, we have very difficult, uh, very, very hard time to understand both. So that morally speaking, it depends on what you want, not really what you do. So even if there is no child, you can still sin against the child. Is, does that, is that clear? Yes? I actually have one more question, uh, but it's not related to that. Uh, I wanted to ask about where the idea of monogamy came from. Because in the time of Abraham, yeah. uh, Jacob, okay. and Isaac, that, you know? Yes. So once again, back to the words of Jesus, that because of the, uh, uh, of the, you were unteachable, or the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, and we could continue, and Moses allowed you to have uh, polygamy. So the issue why polygamy is not, does not fulfill the, uh, the model of marriage is because this love is another kind of love. It's not like friendship. It's a love that is, as we said the other day, has these four legs. And one of the legs, one of the characteristics is totality. So you cannot give yourself totally to one person, and uh, totally to five persons. There will be a kind of injustice because other persons are giving totally themselves to you and you are giving yourself partially to them. And I think most women understand that there is something, that is something kind of unfair in this kind of, of polygamy. But it's a, a good question. Is that, uh, so does that? Was it wrong in the time of it, is, it was wrong, but it was permissible and tolerable because they didn't know any better. We have, uh, so morality is something that we are learning every day. It's not something we invent. That's, that's, uh, thank you, so I have time to explain things I didn't have time to explain. Um, once again, we walk back to the issue of morality is not something that depends on the authority, depends on reality of how God has created the world. And we'll, we get to learn about it. Now we have a better taste of a better uh, standard of morality. We think that the slavery is wrong. We think that uh, torture is wrong, except for uh, some cases. And people still think it's right, etc., etc. So yes, 
we have a better understanding of morality and we are improving in it. Uh, let me just, uh, let us try to do things here. Uh, I will leave that. Uh, Catholics have high regard for celibacy and In? Affirm. Affirm priests and nuns who practice celibacy. We explained this last time. Okay. Uh, however, is it appropriate for married couples to practice celibacy or live apart? Oh, we didn't speak this. Okay. Well, this is a very good question. And the, ans the answer is, in theory, yes. In practice, I would be very reluctant to accept this if the couple are my friends. Okay, once again, why? Because the only celibacy that it is good celibacy is celibacy for the kingdom. So if they tell me, yes, we are like Mother Mary and St. Joseph and we want uh, <laughs> to keep ourselves celibate, there has been some couples that have done that. So in theory, the answer it would be yes. If it is mutual agreement and you decide that it is for a further consecration of the two of you, in theory, yes. But if it is for any other reason, I would think it's something that the couple should not embrace. Once again, because the sexual act is an act that communicates fidelity and union and life. And you stop that communication, the relationship is going to feel that. Okay? So one thing is that you don't decide to have sex. Another thing is that you decide not to have sex. There are two different kinds of decisions. So that decision needs to be justified. And only if it is justified for the sake of the kingdom, I would think that it is something that is more meaningful and more fulfilling. Other than that, uh, it could be a, a, a betrayal of marriage rather than uh, affirmation of it. That's a very good question. OK, yours? Yes? Yes. Yeah, um, so you mentioned about earlier on the guy talked about he talked about um, uh, monogamy, right? Mm -hmm. So just the thought in in the in olden time, remember when Abraham couldn't and Sarah couldn't have children, right? God mm -hmm. sent the slave the slave to Abraham and had children. So could it be that sexuality mm -hmm. changes over time with God's plan, right? Depending on Okay, it's yes. Time, right? so, but, so it could be possible that what you've defined today could change as well with God's plan, I don't know, but could it be possible? Because in the past, that happened. Yes, okay. So once again, sexuality does not change over time. So we are male and female, we are the same. What we do is we discover the rules of sexuality, the morality of sexuality, hopefully better, just like scientists have a better understanding of the world and nature, better with time. It doesn't mean that nature changes. Gravity has been there for thousands of years. It's only when Newton discovered, oh, I know how gravity works. So moral discoveries are the same thing. We have a better understanding of marriage today than uh, 400 years ago, than 1,000 years ago, and that 2,000 years ago. So that is what is happening at all levels, sexuality included. So once again, it's not that sexuality is changing, is that our understanding of the dignity of sexuality is improving as a theology of the body is an understanding of sexuality that we didn't have before John Paul II. Is that? God permits everything. Uh, God permitted Hitler to do many bad things. So there is a difference between what God allows to do and what God wants us to do. Okay. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, when you are thinking, okay. Yes. Uh, is, it, is it wrong in the eyes of God if we don't know the morality, but so we do it, but we don't know that it's wrong? So is it wrong in the eyes of God? Wow. Well. That's a very good question. It goes to the issue of conscience. That is one thing I didn't have time to talk about. Okay, good question. One of the reasons why I said 
I said we can we should judge behavior and we should never judge people is one reason is because moral particular actions depend uh, the responsibility depends on the circumstances so if you are desperate you will be more excusable than if you are not that's one reason the other reason is because people have different consciences conscience is the appreciation of the moral rules the objective moral rules and different people have different appreciation I would expect the Pope has better grasping of moral rules than uh, someone, a, a teenager in, the, I don't know, in, in, in somewhere with no education, perhaps. Okay. So, yes, uh, we should, we will be judged according to our consciences, and we should obey our consciences. Having said that, I have to say the second thing, which is, conscience is not your opinion about moral matters. Is what you think is objectively true, in spite of your opinion on moral matters. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Let me try to just rephrase it. There is always, always a voice that says, am I excusing myself here because I want to get away with it, or because I don't really see anything bad with it? And that is the genuine voice of conscience. Many people today understand the voice of conscience is my personal opinion on moral matters. I think contraception is right. The Pope thinks contraception is wrong. Okay, so the Pope doesn't contracept, and I will contracept. Okay, <laughs> that's how we, we deal with this. Okay, that is not the voice of conscience. The voice of conscience is contraception something really bad or really or, or really good or really neutral, really, in spite of my opinions. So intense always conscience is that voice that wants to get to the truth to the moral truth, not to your personal opinion. It doesn't want to justify you. It is always ready to accuse you. If your conscience never accuses you, chances are, chances are it is not really the voice of conscience. So I hope that is clear. And once it is gen the genuine voice of conscience, we have to obey it. And this is why Abraham was excused of uh, having sex with a, a slave, etc., etc., etc. They were acting in their good conscience. Is that clear? Wow, many questions. Okay, yes. Okay, we know that um, homosexuality is wrong. Very right? well. But then there are people who say, oh, I'm born like that, and then they already suffered. You know, they say they're persecuted and they migrate or they, they, they hide behind, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's also, um, you're born, um, some men are not feminine, and say, oh, I'm born like that, and then um, vice versa. Yes, okay, one of the. Obvious topics in this uh, issue is uh, the uh, same-sex issues. There are four separate issues, and I want to stress the difference. One is the act, homosexual acts, homosexual persons, the person, or so the condition, the person, and the state, the same-sex uh, unions. Can we understand this? One is the act, another one is the condition, okay? Homosexual condition or same-sex attraction. Another one is the persons, and another one is the kind of union. It's the union between two, homo, two uh, people of the same sex, the same as marriage. So there are four different topics here. Okay. So regarding the person, I uh, have to be very clear here, they are persons like anybody else, and they should be treated with love and respect like everybody else. And I think the challenge of the church now is to really make room for these people so that they can be Catholics without shame. Okay. Another thing is to be proud of that. It's, if, if precisely, you're going to say that I was born with it and I'm proud of it because pride is something, if it is your responsibility, then you can be proud of, of, of that because you, you did it. But if it is, if you did nothing about it, then you shouldn't be, there's no reason for you to be proud. It's like me being proud of being bold. I, I did nothing about that. <laughs> <coughs> I received it from my father, I believe. <coughs> So that's the persons, okay. and uh, as I said, that's uh, the challenge of the church, how to start a new mentality of accepting these people, not as, the, the, as if they were weird or something was strange about them. Okay. So the other question is the condition itself. Okay. The condition itself has nothing to do with the morality of the act. Okay. So the condition is that these persons feel attracted to the person of the same sex. If homosexual sex is 
uh, bad, morally bad, then of course there is something undesirable about the condition. But the condition is not morally bad. I, want, I hope this is very, very, very clear. So homosexual persons are not sinful, no more sinful than we are. We all have the same duty of uh, trying to achieve chastity. And the challenge is not much different from our challenge. It's exactly, exactly the same challenge as any single person. You have to be chased, and they have to be chased. So it is exactly the same, the same goal and the same challenge. And because of that, because it adds this, uh, <coughs> this inclination to do something that is morally wrong, then, as I said, it's something that is undesirable uh, as, as, a, as a condition, but not morally bad as a condition. Is that clear? OK. That the <coughs> homosexuals are abominations or things like that, or someone you, you hear in TV or things like that, that has no place in the church. Okay. It is a condition, insofar as they are not responsible for the, that condition, there is no moral implication for this. Okay. Now, they act. So they shouldn't migrate, and if they migrate and it is our fault, then we should do something about that. All right, is that very, very clear? Okay. So they act. Okay. Um, it's the same relationship as kleptomania and stealing. Okay, I want to, to disconnect the two of them. As you know, kleptomania is the tendency, or it has, it's, it's a psychological condition, once again, so it's the condition, that uh, people who experience this feel the urge to steal. Okay? So imagine they say, oh, kleptomania is 100% genetic, and you find the gene. And it is so compulsive that if you don't steal, you die of a heart attack in the middle of a, uh, the shopping center. Would that mean that stealing is right? No. It has no bearings with the morality of stealing. The morality of stealing depends on our understanding of private property. And if you deprive someone of their due property against their reasonable will, it is bad, whether a kleptomaniac does it or a non-kleptomaniac does it. Perhaps, if you tell me kleptomaniacs, they are born that way, I mean, that they are born that way, it is irrelevant, but it is so compulsive that if they don't do it, they die. So the judge may excuse them, or perhaps instead of punishing them, punishing them they will send them for therapy. But that has no bearings. So that's, he's just excusing this kleptomaniac from this act of stealing. The judge is not saying stealing is okay. He's not even saying stealing is okay for you. And the same thing happens here with homosexuality. Homosexuality is the condition. It has no bearings on the morality of homosexual acts. Whether they are done by homosexual people or heterosexual people. And it was, I mean, in the past it was very frequent. It were acts that in the, among the Greeks, for example, I don't know if the Spartans, for example, there is this famous movie, uh, 300, I don't know if you heard him. It looks like a very macho movie, right? Of these 300 Spartans who stood uh, against the enemy and eventually were killed, but it is a very, a very uh, testosterone charged kind of movie. Spartans have routinely homosexual relationship with uh, younger boys, as did many Greeks. And they were normal people. They were married and they have children. It was just a practice they have in the, in the time. So one thing is the act, another thing is the condition. And people without the condition can do the act. And people with the condition don't need to do the act. So the only thing the church is saying is that the only sexual act that is truly meaningful, fulfilling, and, 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 and uh, expressing union is the union of the intimacy of the bodies. And people of the same sex cannot have that union. Only parts that are meant to be united can be united. Other parts can be put together very closely, but they can never form a unity. And if you say that premarital sex is bad for heterosexual people, morally bad, there is no reason why you said it is morally good for homosexual people. That would be discriminating. So I hope the, the, the issue is very clear, that one thing is talking about the condition, another thing is talking about the people, the persons, another thing is talking about the acts. We should judge behavior. We should not judge persons. We should accept everyone as they are. And whether homosexuality is something innate, genetic, or not genetic, it is totally irrelevant 
to the morality of the act, as irrelevant as kleptomania is for the morality of stealing. I hope that is quite clear. Okay. Okay. Yes? Yeah, if, if um, the woman has a condition that the uh, doctor advised that she should not conceive because of some health reason that she may die, then how does this uh, contraception come in place or not? Okay, once I'm, uh, that's a very hard question, and the answer is the same. If you have a choice, you can avoid a pregnancy by knowing when, when you are fertile. So it is not wrong to avoid a pregnancy. It is wrong to make something fertile infertile. There are good reasons why people should avoid pregnancies, because people should have the number of children they can be responsible for. And having more than that would be irresponsible, and being irresponsible is a bad moral choice as well. So as the Pope said, people should not breed like rabbits. Rabbits are irresponsible breeders, okay? <laughs> people should be responsible breeders. <laughs> okay, they, they should uh, procreate with responsibility. So couples should decide in freedom uh, how many children they can care for responsibly and with freedom, responsibility and generosity. So both things will be wrong. Not to have as many children as you could have may not be so generous of you. And generosity is a virtue that we should all cultivate. In the four forms of generosity, this is probably the highest. Okay. At the same time, you have to be responsible. This would be one of the cases. If you know the wife is going to die, then you should avoid a pregnancy. So the, that is good. The question is, how are you going to avoid a pregnancy? It is good to save five people tied, tied uh, to a railway, but pushing a fat guy to save five people is bad. Turning a train is good. Avoiding fertile sex to avoid the pregnancy is good. Contracepting would be wrong. So once again, the question is in the means. There are good means and bad means attain the good end, but the, that would be a case of a good end. But, it, but it's still not the same good question, because let's say um, the woman has a heart, heart problem or whatever, but then if, if the contraception is not taken place, then in the event if she's pregnant, then she yes, yes. danger, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so you should avoid a pregnancy. So then you should be making things that is fertile, infertile? No, you don't have to. You have another choice. The only thing you have to do is you have to avoid fertile sex. Yeah, but I'm not too sure about this uh, and, and uh, natural medicine. Is how how uh, effective it is. It is as effective as many methods of contraception, if not more. Yeah, that's that's proven. I mean, condoms, for example, that is one of the most effective. If you go to the, you read the the. Uh, the small letter there, it will tell you it is 85% effective in normal use. That's, if your wife is going to die, I don't suggest that you use condoms. It will be just as uh, more risk, risky, in fact, than the natural family planning, well, well practiced. So once again, good end. So what means you accept you, you are going to, to use for that is what the, the moral issue depends on. Yes, yes. That's not a very sexy question. <laughs> okay. I think there's a kind of uh, pets are meant for us. They have a purpose of uh, satisfying our needs. And I think that is very obvious when you see dogs dressed in pink uh, colors and eating ice cream and all that. Is that that for the purpose of the dog or the purpose of pleasing the owner? Okay. So that is okay, they are animals, so you can use them as means. That's something we cannot do with people. You cannot use people as means to other ends. So if the purpose of the dog has finished and you think that you should spare the dog some suffering, 
you're perfectly entitled to kill it. We kill animals all the time for good purposes because animals can be used. People should not be used. There's a big difference between the two. That your children around you are asking, are going to be thinking that you're making the decision so, so, so simply. And then you're trying to explain to them, oh, okay, when you talk to your loved one, yeah, yeah, you have to explain the difference very well. It says, okay, the dog is just a dog, so we can make the decision because we kill animals for our own purposes, just like we cut trees and we do all kinds of things, but uh, we, don't make, we don't kill people to fit our purposes yeah, because they are people and should be respected and, and cared for as they are. Okay, let me answer, uh, so that's, that's quite clear, okay. Uh, let me answer one question that is here. I'm channeless, what? Why can I go for IVF? Uh, that's a very good question, and I didn't even have uh, today, I didn't plan for that. Uh, there are three good reasons why uh, the church has objections to IVF. Okay. The first one is that uh, when you go for IVF, you, you not only fertilize just one egg that is implanted in your womb, you fertilize lots of them, five, six, even more, okay? And they will implant, chances are they will implant two, which means there are four still there that may be already your embryos, they are already your children. And if the embryo that uh, is implanted on you, uh, two of them or one of them, uh, this pregnancy is carried to term, very often you're not, you're not going to say, oh, can you implant the other three or the other four? actually have some people coming to me and say, I had my child through IVF, and now I have six embryos in the, in the center, and they're asking me, after so many years, they say, we don't keep them anymore, either you take them or we dispose of them. Okay, so for every IVF child out there that you see, there are many IVF of their brothers and sisters that have been terminated because of this. So IVF, once again, what the question here is, yes, it has good results. Just like pushing a fat guy can save five people. But that is not the only question we should ask. The other question is, is this the way people should be made? Okay. So first of all, not if it entails the death of, because there is no reason why you think that this is my child and the other one is not. If one, you consider one your child, the other one is also your child. And I, I, Actually, this is a very painful choice for many, for many women. Okay. There is another reason, if, even if in the event that the one day IVF is practiced by implanting only two embryos, or fertilizing only two embryos and implanting, implanting all of them. For what we said here, that uh, the child should be made from the act of love of their parents. And IVF is not the act of love, and it is not the act of their parents. It is an act of technicians. The technician doesn't help you to have the child. The technician says, you cannot do it. Go home, give me the materials. I make the child for you. So that is an intrusion in the intimacy of the couple. Now that we talk about intimacy, just like the person has intimacy, the couple should have an intimacy too. And they should not be replaced in those actions. They can be helped. So technology should help. If when technology can help the marital act to be fertile, some, there are some techniques that help to do this, they are entitled to do this. So helping the marital act to be, fer to be fertile is very different from saying, I don't even need you to have a marital act because I will make the child for you. And the third uh, reason why IVF is not uh, uh, considered morally right in the church is because of the way it treats children. It treats uh, children as products and not as persons. Okay? There is a difference between making and procreating. Making is always an act of the mind, that you put parts together and it fulfills what you have in your mind. That is how we make technology, that's how we make buildings. Procreating is an act of the body. It is not an act of the mind. Animals generate other animals and they don't plan Okay, any pregnant mother doesn't stop thinking, today I will make the hands. Let us see if I can put five fingers in the hand, another five fingers into the hand. It is not an act of your mind. It is not a fabricating act. It does not depend on the will of the person. It is an act of the body. 
and because it doesn't have so when we make things we treat we we are the persons and we are doing something so there is a difference in dignity between the maker and the object in the case of uh, generating and procreating there should not be there is no difference between the dignity of the parents and the dignity of the children they are all in the same treated in the same they are of the same dignity Therefore, the, the, the relationship and the actions between them should respect this relationship. And this is why people should not be made, should be generated. We say something very similar in the Creed about Jesus Christ. Or the same, he, we say that he was of the same nature of the Father. He was uh, begotten, not made. Okay. So God didn't make his son, and we shouldn't make our children, understanding making as this activity of the brain that treats uh, things like products. When I make a chair, I have the idea of, my, of the chair in my mind, and then I control the making of the chair. The chair is my product, my object. I know this sounds very, um, perhaps unusual to, to use just uh, one word, but if you think about uh, these matters, imagine the government in Singapore one day tells you that, uh, look, we need more Singaporeans, and Singaporeans are not cooperating. We told them to stop at two, they didn't. Now we tell them to continue after three, they don't. So let us forget about, Singaporeans are totally in, uh, unreliable when it comes to fertility. So this is what we are going to do. We are going to have a egg bank and a sperm bank, and next year we need 1,500 Singaporeans, we fertilize 105,000 eggs, with our banks, and voila, you have 1,500 Singaporeans. No need for foreigners to come here. So you have a more peaceful Singapore, full of Singaporeans, more efficient. Right? How many of you would object to that? I hope many of you. Okay? And the question is why? Because you think that people should not be used as tools. And these people will be created to satisfy the need of the country. So the question is not that you make people. The question is how you make people. Because that is, the question is not how you save five people, but how you save five people. You can turn a train, you shouldn't push a fat guy. So once again, the question of the means is the crucial question here. In IVF, it's very easy to think. Once again, I don't know who wrote this. I have friends who went through IVF and all that. Once again, I want this to be very, very clear. Judging behavior is not judging people. I don't know why people did it. Perhaps if I were in the place, I would do it. I don't know if I would drink seawater if I were desperate and dying of thirst. I'm not going to judge people who drink seawater, but if you ask me, is drinking seawater good or bad, I have to tell you it is bad. And I hope you had the courage not to drink it. And that's all I can say. And the same thing goes for every, every single moral issue. Some people ask me, doesn't studying moral theology or moral or ethics make you more judgmental? I say, it precisely that's the opposite. Precisely because I, I think I understand a bit more about morality makes me less judgmental of people and more judgmental about behavior. So the question for us is, is IVF something we should approve or not? And the mission for us? And the answer is no, because children need, deserve, uh, have the right to be born of the act the procreating act of love of his parents. And other act would be treating them as objects or means to other ends. It doesn't mean that every child that is born of the sexual act of the parents is a good act, okay? So it has to be an act of love, unconditional love, once again. So I hope that is um, clear. Any last questions, I think? To my, okay, we started a, a bit late, so I wanted, I suppose it is okay to finish a bit late too. Uh, yes, I have one question. Yes. I just wonder, the theology of the body, mm. if it has been conceived by woman, whether the conclusion would have been very different. <laughs> the reason I say that, because women approach to sexuality and men approach to sexuality are different. Very good. I think, I think there's research being done that when you look at the seven capital sin, the number one sin that men confess is the sin of lust. But I think the sin of lust 
uh, for women, probably ranked fourth or fifth. I think the number one sin for women, probably jealousy or something like that. So, it's a new capital sin. Okay. So, yeah, okay. On, on that basis, surely that there must there must be some difference that comes out of it, you know, given that women and men attitude towards sexuality is different. Okay, I like the question, and think without question we finish the whole thing. So first of all, it is, I don't know if you have been uh, eavesdropping to my confessional box, but uh, it is true, okay? It is true. So uh, this is something that we have to be very clear. Sexual differences, and perhaps with this I, I, I link with the first question, I don't know what the gender theory is. Sexual differences are not simply physical differences. This is what a dualistic approach will have it, how, how a dualistic approach will have it. Sexual differences are deep differences. And deep, how deep, as everybody, every level, biologically, psychologically, and spiritually. When we go to heaven, we will be either male or female. We will not, we will not be uh, something in between, or something without the gender. So being male or female is part of who we are. And which means that we not only look different, we behave different. There are psychological differences. We commit sins differently. And these differences are complementary. It means that what you find a lot in men, you have uh, less in women. And what you find a lot in women, you have find less in men. They are not so different that we cannot talk to each other and cannot comprehend each other. There are some similarities so that we can guess more or less what the other gender is feeling, but not enough. So that's why we are complementary. The two of us will make, we are made for each other. We are made to fit in each other, okay? So, which means, because not only look, look different, they think different, they sin differently, and they understand spirituality in a different way. And this is exactly what theology of the body is all about. So if John Paul II had been a woman, he would have written another thing, but the conclusions at that level would have been very similar. Because this is what John Paul II is talking about. He's not talking about from the male perspective. He's talking about the fact that we are so different because God wanted us to be not only chaotically different, but fittingly different. And so, okay. Women would have written a lot of uh, a lot of things with a lot of conclusions, perhaps. And that's why it is good that uh, now the women theologian, I had uh, women lecturers, and you can see the difference in the approach in the lectures and everything. And they write different conclusions. But that is why we need, even in theology, we need men and we need women. And in working, in government, in, uh, in other aspects in life, we need men and we need women because they will have something to contribute that the other uh, gender uh, may not contribute so well. So in that sense, yes. So we are waiting for the next um, women theologian who writes the female uh, understanding of theology of the body. And with that, I think we should allow people to go to bed. If you have more questions, I'm very glad to stay behind and try to answer those questions. Just, just one last question for the teenagers. Transgender mindset. OK, what is the opinion, your opinion on the issue of transgender mindset? OK, so. Uh, once again, sexual differences are, are deep differences. So a transgender person, is not, it's not that there is something wrong with the body of the person. It's something wrong with the sexual identity of the person. That there is a discrepancy between what they want to be and what they are. Okay? So what is wrong here is not anything in the body. It's something on their understanding. So many, there is a psychological therapy for these people, and it is much better than they fix their uh, uh, understanding of themselves rather than they change the body to fit the misunderstanding in the mindset. So usually you fix what is uh, Nick's fixing and if nothing is wrong with your body then you don't fix the body or you, you don't change the body that looks like something that wants to fit your, your mindset. I hope that is, uh, that is uh, quite clear. And with that, uh, no more finish, so we finish here. Um, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Almighty Father, you are love in yourself. As we finish these sessions, we ask you to give us 
in this year of mercy that we are going about to begin, a uh, compassionate heart, that we may be uh, faithful ministers of your compassion for the world, and that we may learn to change our hearts and accept everyone, and that we may communicate your message of love uh, to the people we minister to, and that we may evangelize with this message also the people who need it most. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you.